famous, infamous proverbial cloud. This is Wednesday, January 9th, 2019, our first Rex call of 2019. After 2018, all bets are off, anything could happen. It is very nice to see you all. I have a, uh, I have a sort of a tried and true poem for us since I think going with something rock solid is probably a good way to go right now for the year. It's a title, uh, it's a poem titled Wild Geese by Mary Oliver, which goes as follows. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Let me give that a second read. Wild Geese by Mary Oliver. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Welcome to 2019, everybody. <laughs> How is anyone? Anyone want to check in? An awkward number. 2019? Yeah. <laughs> it's a prime, isn't it? Well, I think it's divisible by something. Divisible by 2019 and one? <laughs> is it a prime number? I do not know. Um, well, three times 673. Oh, really? That too is an odd number. Huh. <laughs> it's all so strange. Um, has uh, Greg, uh, you've stepped away from, from leading the consortium. How has, how has 2019 done differently from you? For you. Well, this is <clears throat> a year of transition for me from uh, yeah, leading the work of the consortium to retirement. So we have a new executive director, Matt Seaman, who's been with us for many years and very excited about him joining. And uh, I'll work with him over the next 12 months or so or whatever is necessary. Maybe it'd be less. <clears throat> and then uh, probably plan to do some writing. We're, we're way behind on deliverables uh, that capture the observations and experiences that we've had over the last probably five years. So to tell the stories of what's been happening, Ken? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah. Excellent. I'm looking forward to not being the decision maker. <laughs> I find that exhausting at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people are. Uh, Susan, the, the phone number is, uh, is April. She just asked on the chat who the, who the phone number was. Um, yeah, well, thanks, Greg. And, and uh, do you have any plans to go deeper into anything you've been curious about for the last decade? Is there, is there like a, a small scale quest in the back of your mind on the something you care about? Well, I think, um, one of the things we have yet to solve is a really effective reputation model for a highly collaborative environment. We talked mm -hmm. about 
uh, some months ago on this forum. Um, that continues to be a challenge. So, but there's there's a ton of stuff, observations and lessons learned around intelligent swarming and predictive customer engagement and how not to be creepy, which we've also talked about on <laughs> on this. Mm -hmm. um, the you know the difference between, I guess. It's, a, it's interesting to me how simplistically organizations approach the things they have to accomplish. And you know, abundance is one of those that I think there are times when you operate from a principle of abundance and there are times where you have to operate from a principle of scarcity and the ability to make that switch. Is that called a duality? Uh, it could be called a polarity. It could be called a dile dilemma is a good word for it. Yeah. Um, duality might work. I don't know if anybody uses duality that way here. Oh. And it, and it reminds me of David Snowden's, you know, Kinefin model where you can't treat everything the same. Not all problems are the same. Yeah. And yet organizations that, at least the ones we work with, tend to approach things in a fairly simplistic, linear and singular sort of way rather than appreciating that there are different ways to approach different, based on the situation. So. Well, you, you can look at the same exact thing and try to solve something. And depending how you frame it, you might take a completely different approach. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You might take a pragmatic approach to, to do something physical to the environment. And if, if you see the problem one way, then you might actually go try to solve something larger environmental if you, if you see it a different way. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, um, you've influenced a lot of the thinking around consumers and consumption. Um, and that from a service point of view, you don't consume a service, you experience it. Um, and, but that feels to me like a losing battle to change that vocabulary. <laughs> really? Well, I, you know what? I haven't, actually, <clears throat> I haven't actually fought that battle, and it sounds like a really fun battle to me. Like, like, like the let's, let's, let's flush the word down the toilet kind yeah. of battle. Yeah, especially in a service or customer experience environment. Yeah. Consumption is, uh, it has no place in the vocabulary for that. So, Jerry, why have you not done that? That I is, would have thought that that would be one of the first things you would have tackled. Susan, that is a very, very good question. Um, I don't know. I, I, I've done it a lot in speeches. I've done it, I've done it sort of on, on local small bore stuff all over the place. Uh, there have been many an event where I'll give a talk and talk about the word consumer, et cetera, et cetera. And then I watch it play out for the rest of the event. You know, the, the next speaker apologizes and stumbles over the word. The third speaker says it and doesn't care, but then I get glances from other people in the room who are looking at me with that, you know, see, 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 it's everywhere. Yeah. So, so at that scale, I've done it often and, and worked, and I hope that it's kind of an earworm. It's, it's you know, something that people will, will, will go, oh, crap, i got to kind of remember that. Now, uh, the yeah. other thing is if you go big bore on it, then you get labeled as that, and they will only invite you to talk about that. <laughs> uh, that's true too. That's true too. And I and I didn't want to be like the the guy who's angry about consumer. Um, uh, and yet, and yet, it's certainly something worth putting a lot of uh, energy behind for a, for a burst and seeing where that goes. Uh, what I haven't been able to figure out, I think, is what's the bumper sticker for it? Because the short phrase is "We're not consumers; we're humans," or something like that, mm. right? We're not consumers is not a, an inspiring phrase. It, I, it, it, no. doesn't, it doesn't actually work for me. We are something. We're, we're menshes, not consumers. But, but in order to defeat the word consumer, you have to stigmatize it. You have to give it a, you have to give it a little packet of purple dye. And something you know? to replace it. <laughs> and, and something to replace it, which, which I, uh, I'm happy to do. <clears throat> I mean, I give people a whole vocabulary of words to replace it, just, just not prosumer or, or other funny neologisms. I'm not, I'm not fond of the, of the fake replacements. I think it has to sound like us. It has to sound like humans. Um, it's a good question. You're, you're provoking me to... Uh, um, how about we are human beings? Add the beings, or does that make it too long? Um, it's not bad. Confessional, je may say more? You're muted. Sorry, um, prosumer is a combination of, you know, pro from professional and right. con for, or, and sumer from consumer. So just flipping that, uh, the opposite of, of prosumer is confessional. A, a con professional. 
Well, I like your comment on tuberculosis rather than <laughs> consumption. That's, that puts it in the right context in my mind. <laughs> that is what consumption used to mean. Exactly. Uh, I'm reading Empire of Things. Oh, why would you just remember. say consumption used to be? Yeah. Go ahead. Too, too many letters. Yeah. Uh, long I'm, lips are confusing and scary. I was reading Empire. I've been reading Empire of Things. I'm still not done with it. It's the history of consumerism and consumption. Super, super, really interesting, including, including, you know, including the fact that India before the British show up is quite self-sufficient in food and clothing. Like they have, you know, everybody knows how to weave. Saris are an ancient tradition. They make beautiful fabric, but it's all done on hand looms. Basically, it's a craft done. It's a cottage industry, not even really thought of as an industry. Um, the British show up, they illegalize the loom. Uh, they, they turn India basically into a plantation for uh, sending materials to England. Um, and then the British make stuff in Manchester and elsewhere and ship cloth back, which they force everybody to buy. So now your cloth has to come from England, which works for a while until and the British are very reticent because on the one hand, they're really quite racist and classist. So they don't really want to elevate the Indian people to be consumers. On the other hand, heck, there's this gigantic market. These people should be buying our products. So grudgingly, they start selling them stuff until Indians start developing a sense of fashion and style and what looks old. And it's like they start refusing to buy some shipments that come in because no, 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 that's the last season's fashion. And I, I won't buy that anymore. And that's, that's very frustrating for the Brits who figure this is just like, it's a good deal. You should, you should just go this way. So a bunch of stuff like that. Um, uh, another insight I think I've shared on a, on a Rex call is that um, abolitionism is a boost for, for consumerism. So um, before abolitionism, the way you could tell who had high status in society and who was the richest person was who owned the most lives. That was the, that was the show of wealth, like who had the most slaves, who had the most control over the most humans, whether it was serfs, slaves, or whoever. That was who the richest person was. And then abolitionism comes in and says, no, 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 owning humans, not so cool. You're going to have to learn to do that economically or some other way. Um, and suddenly the show of wealth becomes important. And suddenly people start making luxury goods and then consumer goods after that. But, but suddenly the, the, the owning and showing of stuff and the dressing uh, much nicer and so forth, really, it's not, no longer a thing just for the royalty and the top of the aristocracy where it was always important. Like dressing beautifully was always important to show, to show high status. Now that becomes a thing that everybody starts step, stepping into who can afford it um, because that's how you show your wealth and position. So abolitionism, unfortunately, is a boost to consumerism. Very weird. Hmm. Uh, stuff like that. Very, you know, we deal with um, <clears throat> that very same thing in organizations. The executives assess their power base and their wealth based on the number of people that report to them, which is kind of archaic, I guess, and, and certainly is not based on a model of abundance or a principle of abundance. <clears throat> and it gets, it's, hugely disruptive to creating a highly collaborative uh, organization. So I want to throw something out that, that just has started, I'm going to start ruminating about, I mean, as in like in the last couple of minutes. I um, wonder if there is a connection between the rise of consumerism and the decline of uh, village culture, small, you know, small community oh. culture, because, you know, as Jerry points out with the, um, you know, with his connection with abolition, um, part of what happens with consumerism is trying to display a particular style, trying to display a particular something about your identity, which is less necessary if everybody knows everybody else's intimate details. <laughs> but it, when you're in a mass society mm -hmm. where you where it, a less individual or less individually recognizable society then you need to be able to show yourself, you know, peacock a bit in one way or another to be able to be identifiable and to be able to show your distinctiveness from the gray masses. And so I wonder, and this is just, like I said, conjecture off the top of my head, uh, if there is, you know, there's not much on top of my head. Um, <laughs> hey, Bill. Uh, makes me wonder if there is a you know, interesting cultural connection between the rise of consumerism and the decline of very small communities. 
I think you're right, Jermaine. Uh, but because if you think about the small village life, which really, you know, ex final extinction event happened in the 19th century. Uh, everyone knew who you were. So if you wanted to dress well and be better than you were, everyone would laugh at you. They'd know who you were. They knew how much money you had. They knew who your father was. They knew it all. Um, so <laughs> it wouldn't work in that society to pretend you were something you were not. Hmm. Just so. Um, also, uh, a, a tremendous amount of, you know, the now very highly evolved form of consumerism we have is all about how do you show that you're an individual? How do you separate yourself from the crowd by buying stuff? And how do you create your identity through branding? And, 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 and consumerism wants everybody to have their own thing. Um, I keep remembering, and I can't find it uh, anymore. I need to ask Doug, because I'm pretty sure it was in an introduction to a Doug Rushkoff book. Um, but he describes how he, he grew up in Long Island in a lower middle class community where every, every weekend was really cool because they lived on a cul-de-sac and every weekend one of the parents would come out and put some coals in the, in the one brazier that was there in, in the park. And then everybody would come out and put their food on. And there was a block party every weekend, basically. And then his dad got a promotion and they moved over to Westchester where everybody had their own barbecue. <laughs> and, and the block party died, right? And, and I, it's a very nice story. It's a really crisp little story that says, yeah, prosperity basically separates us mm -hmm. often. Um, and then this need to keep buying stuff and having stuff was pumped, was driven, because if we stop buying stuff, the, the economy stops and then really bad things happen. So, so Susan's asking in the chat, does it have to do with identity? Very much. And then one of the weird things that happened, and I haven't, I haven't been able to really track down the causes so much yet, is that we used to have initiation rituals for our youth. Um, and also, when kids grew up, they grew up in community so that <clears throat> the neighbors and all, everybody else knew you by the time you were 18. You had, you had swept, you had done their lawn for years, you had swept their snow, you were there when they were stuck. Um, all of these things have kind of been, been cut away in many communities, not everywhere, but, but mostly cut away so that we don't know our neighbors. And we're, we're thus, uh, part of the problem here is when you have an initiation ritual and you come up in community, you have a society, like you have an identity rather, sorry. You, you are known within that community. And when you don't have that identity, you need to turn to other things, things that look more dangerous, things that are outside identity. You pick up whatever is the edgiest thing because a part of an initiation ritual is actually danger, right? A good initiation ritual puts you out in the wilderness for two weeks to come back with an elk that you've skinned by yourself or something. I don't know, but, but initiation does involve sort of pushing the edge of your capacity, uh, breaking some new boundaries, uh, whatever it might be. And we, we got rid of those. We have no initiation rituals for our youth. We don't bring, and elders have, there's discrimination, there's ageism, ageism is rampant, and elders are no longer pulling young people up into society in different ways. So gangs, smoking, drugs, uh, looking like a, a hood from the, from, you know, a gangster from the hood, whatever it is, is insanely appealing. Um, and then a, a last touch, which is really ironic. There's a, a, a woman photographer who went around photographing cliques from different groups. And she did like the London skinheads that used to have the big, you know, hair stuck up like this. And uh, <coughs> she went to each group and group to group, they were incredibly different. Like they looked, the skinheads looked really different from, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the, what uh, David Bowie was when he started his career a something boy. Um, and yet within group, the differences were minute, minute. Mm -hmm. So the whole group within one clique all had a chain dangling from their, their belt, all had studded jeans, the studs would be in a different pattern. They were all wearing Doc Martens, all of them. Like if you didn't have Doc Martens, you weren't cool. So, so in group, um, identity was differentiated on a m much finer scale. Oh, yes, yes. And there's a woman, Penny Eckert at Stanford who did jocks and burnout studies. Hmm. And, uh, and, you know, it, it really is, I mean, I don't know why we're surprised by this, because we all grew up through this. We all learned how to, you know, do identities in high school. Um, we were only offered a couple. Uh, and she, but the best story I, I remember from her, her research was um, taking the kids who were the burnouts, and in this case, the goths, uh, uh, in a high school here in Palo Alto, and, <laughs> and uh, asking them what those particular things meant, okay. 
And so, you know, what does, and they kept talking about, you know, they had, um, uh, they were wearing things with skulls on them, of course. And what does that mean? And, uh, and one, of the, one of the girls said, oh, it means death. And one of the guys go, oh, well, I thought it meant pirates. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, so it's a very, it could be a very shallow uh, kind of thing. But I also, again, you know, uh, leave it living next to the ocean be, being men at night. The difference between hooks and eyes and buttons, the difference between uh, all of those different things is, is, is manifest. Um, and zippers. Oh, my God, zippers. Huge deal. So the other thing was um, was also noticing in villages in India where the color of the saris varied from village to village. Now the villages were fairly close, but it, and they were bright. I mean, you go to one and it was all sort of pinks and purples and blues, and you go to the next one and it was yellows and oranges and reds, and you go to the next one and it was something else. And the the variation in the patterns was was very very small, uh, and the way they wore their saris uh, was was pretty much the same from village to village. But the sari wearing, whether you let it fall off your, your shoulder, whether you, how many, how many folds you put into it at the top, how you, I mean, it's, it's just so, so prevalent. It's, uh, and I don't think that's changed. We change maybe well, what I, things are. I, th I think this carries through to modern American society. Yeah, it absolutely. just takes different shapes, right? We just, yeah. the, the, the need, the need to belong and the need to be, identified as an individual, both are really, really strong in humans. And these are ways in which that plays out. And, uh, and I think the converse is true too, if it's the converse, is that right? Which is that people, um, is that it's important also to not be like someone. Right. So you, you know, there's, there's great stories about, um, uh, there's a, a woman who was a graduate student at UC Irvine who was studying with Jean Lave and she, um, she was able to, to, to sit in front of you and transform herself from a white person to a black person. And wow. it, was, it was very powerful. Hmm. Uh, and uh, she dressed outrageously because she, I think, didn't want to say, I mean, I don't know, but it's possible mm -hmm. that she didn't want to signal um, on, on the basis of her dress what, what was going on. So that, I think that being, not wanting to be like those people when we were doing things at the Institute for Research on Learning, a lot mm -hmm. of uh, not wanting to learn math was not wanting to be like the people who did math. I just read Trevor Noah's um, Born a Crime. Autobiography, Autobiography yeah. yeah. And he does an interesting thing about language uh, along those same lines. Um, you know, if you talk like me, then you're likely to be like me. And if you talk in a different way with a different accent or different language, then that creates problems. <laughs> it's a really interesting, I thought very interesting observation. Yeah, I think we should stop of... talking about hierarchy and talk, talk about inside, outside. Say more? Um, when we talk about problems in organizations, we tend to talk about in corporations, for instance, is all this top down, bottom up stuff. It's just the wrong dimension for getting anything done. Um, I mean, the structure of how work gets done and the structure of how you do your work is, is an inside outside kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you, know, you signal lots of things, whether you pick up the phone and call someone, when you pick up the phone and call someone, when you use email, when you use Zoom, when you use Skype, when you use, um, it's all still there. We um, talk about it as a network. Is that the same as inside outside? No, actually, I don't think it is quite the same. Uh -huh. um, two things, two reasons. Uh, one of them is that it's not, networks don't do anything. I mean, they don't do work. Really? They ship information around, but they don't really interpret it. They don't me make meaning of it. They don't do anything with it. Um, and so it's, it's an important social configuration, but it's not the same. And there are various... Uh, once upon a time, I had a model of about six or seven kinds of uh, uh, parameters, which you could switch around and you could get gangs and you could get, you know, communities of practice and you could get um, interest groups and you could get out of all those, you just miss, just adjust all the little parameters there. 
Um, yeah. So uh, uh, there's some who would assert things only happen because of a network. It's because of who work gets done because people know who to get things done with. Um, who, who at the well, book? that's the network that you have. Uh, I mean, if, if that's true, I would look at the network and I would find more, more parameters of, of cohesion. I think it's how cohesive it is. Well, and there's, um, in that's one social, <laughs> yeah. And then social network analysis, who wrote the book, the secret, the, the hidden power of social networks. Um, some years ago, it's, um, oh. and from IBM, he, he does a lot of work with social network analysis and there's some, no, there's some 20 parameters that they lead mm -hmm. from uh, social network analysis that talks about closeness and distance and Absolutely. cohesion is one of them. But, um, but I don't to even call remember. all of those things networks is to, is to miss, I think, some of the important subtleties about which configurations are best for what. Andrew Parker and Robert Cross. Yes. Robert that's Cross. Right. Yeah. Robert Cross, yeah. Right, right. I mean, his assertion was that's the only way work gets done is because of the relationship between people. I think that's not true. Not a reporting structure. Well, certainly not a reporting structure. That's not, that's true. <laughs> but I think that there's, a, well, sorry, I'm a student of work, I'm gonna shut up. Uh, student of work and, and how it gets done, so. But I was thinking that, I, I, I think Susan, that what you're saying overlaps pretty nicely with some of the stuff I think is coming out of economics too, where we're moving from this model of kind of optimization and you know, people are, are optimizing utility kind of in the old days to yeah. behavioral economics stuff, but still not understanding the motivations of behavioral economics. Right. And I think we're starting to see, you know, what people really optimize around is relative to their group or groups they compare against. That's so right. I want a house a little bigger than my neighbors. I want my CEO, my CEO needs to be paid a little bit more than the other CEOs. So it's a relative ranking. Mm -hmm. which I think is kind of the inside outside idea. Mm -hmm. And I know like this guy at Duke has been talking about some of this stuff and it's kind of like, Oh yeah. Cause it helps under me understand some of the politics stuff. Oh, you yeah. know, what are the Trump people trying to do? Well, they're, they're, they're adjusting, you know, they're comparing themselves to certain cohorts and wanting to be, what was the, the line that the woman had the other day that he's hurting the wrong people, you know? <laughs> yes. Um, yes. He's, 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 not, he's hurting. <laughs> He's supposed to be hurting those other people. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and I think it's those people in that group that are the, the things that we naturally compare to. And so there'll be some new economics around optimizing around group categories or something. Right. I think well, um, if, I can, if I can just clarify for a second, um, the feeling I get in the, maybe the semantic distinction between networks and inside outside groups is that the network doesn't appear to have boundaries within it. So there's no inside or outside, it's a network. And it's like, it has sort of complete, whatever fr frictionless or friction full access it has between the people, but it, it doesn't like the, the no like inside outside is maybe a series of overlapping small networks, right? Because, well, yeah, because so if you want everything to be a network, then it becomes meaningless, but yeah. Right. Right, and, and, and weird things happened once everybody could reach the CEO if you knew their email or if you could just, you know, there, there was this weird democratization of communication when email shows up because even outside people can suddenly come in and, and, and you know, there used to be defense measures so that nobody got to talk to the top leaders, right? right. There, were, there were a series of filters that would pretty much get rid of your message. Um, so it was pasteurized and homogenized by the time, you know, the CEO heard about it. Those things are kind of gone. Everybody's pretty visible. Um, Somebody else was, was chiming in. And Bill, did you want to jump in? Um, I just happen to be focusing right now <clears throat> on pure relationship issues, which is an interesting mm -hmm. overlay on this. Uh, the, the three uh, psychologists that, that I'm reading on are Dr. Sue Johnson, who wrote Hold Me Tight, uh, and uh, John Wellwood, who's got, who's got a book out called or the psychology of awakening, which is basically integrating psychology with spirituality, but in a very functional way. And that the third one that really touches on a lot of what we're talking about here is work of a psychologist by the name of Terence Real, R-E-A-L, who I'm right now reading a book. He's got, How Can I Get Through to You? 
which has got a brilliant sort of breakdown of his fundamental issue, which is that we've got a patriarchal, psychological, pathological process going on for thousands of years. And it basically eats into everything else that we've been talking about, whether it's hierarchy issues, network issues, relationship issues, the difference between a village and, and not a village, all of those things basically get eviscerated because of the hidden aspect. And he not only talks about it hidden in the sense that we don't really sort of pay attention to it, but, but it's almost like psychologically it's intended not to be talked about because we really, really want to dig into the victimization of the woman, the feminine. In other words, that it's really, really bad. And we don't even talk about it because if we have to talk about it, then it's going to get worse. You know, and so it's really, you know, giving a different perspective to everything that we're talking about in relationship exchange, because if, if we don't understand what's um, basically undermining the notion of a relationship, in other words, all the discussion of consumerism, in other words, we're trying to figure out where's the beginning of this erosion, where is the beginning that we need to go back and pay attention to, because if we don't pay attention to it, it's gonna keep eroding. It's like the proverbial, you know, bailing the boat faster and faster when you got a hold the bottom of it, nobody's paying attention to the hold the bottom of the boat. So it, it's, it's fascinating and all the stories, you know, that, that Terence Real tale tells uh, are, are amazing. In other words, the resistance that males have to even, uh, you know, personally in relationships and everything addressing this because they don't want to let go of their dominance. And they have the, the ability to just walk away. Oh, she's got a problem. You know, I'm going to walk away. It's, um, Bill, thank you. This is a really rich, uh, and I don't know any of these books, so I'll go look them up, but it's a really rich path into discussion, I, and I completely agree. Um, over the last week or two, I've been paying a lot of attention to Aboriginal ways of knowing and watched a couple of simple TED Talks that were really, really moving about uh, things that had happened and realized... Um, uh, a thing I had realized, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a thing I had, re I had re learned about the Americas from the book 1491 by Charles Mann, which was that before the Europeans show up, most of the American landmass is under active human management. It just doesn't look like what Europeans do to it. That it's not fences where I'm growing pears and you have cows. It's basically everybody working the landscape with fire, with careful planting and pruning, with, uh, you know, uh, with herding, a whole series of other things. Well, it turns out that Australia, the Aborigines had done the same thing in Australia for a hell of a lot longer because Aboriginal customs go back to at least 60,000 years, may go back longer. Everybody keeps discovering new evidence of, of earlier sort of trans, transmissions. So I say all of that because uh, one of the talks I watched was about intergenerational trauma, which is a very real thing, I believe. And that brought me all the way up to, you know, identity politics, which became a very, very hot thing in this last election cycle, is clearly a hot thing for people on the far right to poke at because, hey, look, everybody gets really mad when we poke at this thing. It's like a hornet's nest. <clears throat> and, and sort of this transgenerational trauma is, is the background fuel. It's the underground coal fire that's been burning for centuries that bubbles up every now and then into things like Black Lives Matter, into things like you know, the, the, when, when the shit hits the fan socially these days. And the more we don't deal with these things, the, the stronger that fire sort of glows underneath. Um, and so again, this is protection of, of white, you know, white men in, in, large, in large measure because they're the ones who went out and, and kind of did this years ago. Um, and, and I'm trying to figure out how do you frame or phrase this in a way that somebody who's resisting it might actually go, gosh, maybe we should apologize. Or maybe we should realize we have a generational responsibility, if not a personal responsibility. Because the, the arguments against are things like, I didn't do this, right? <clears throat> it's, it's not me who did this, it's some people way back when, and who knows what they did, and why, don't, why can't bygones be bygones is the, the thing. And, and all of this is part of this identity conversation, I think, because you know, uh, identity politics is an attempt to be seen for who you are and where you come from, right? When you take, when you make identity politics clear away its political uh, taint and come back to what the issues are and what's going on, it's just an attempt to be seen and heard. It's not, uh, I mean, I wouldn't say even seen, right? It's like, you are who you are, where you came from, right? I mean, it, 
It's kind of, its identity of politics is just politics, right? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, and that was a whole bunch of different different things piled on to what you started with, Bill. I think I took us a little a little afield, but I'm interested in what this uh, what this melange of things uh, means to any of us. But but to just use one particular example that uh, was sort of like the beginning point of Dr. Sue Johnson's work on relationship response, in other words, the, the willingness of each of us to respond to the emotional needs of the other, which to an extent is that intergenerational thing that you're talking about. In other words, we don't necessarily see it coming, but obviously intergenerational, that's going to be important. In any event, if you go on, on YouTube, she's got a, uh, an example of some research where a mother is in a room basically playing with her one-year-old son. And the, it's very nice, you know, that the son is responding, he's giggling, he's, he's being very, very emotionally stable. And then they have her for just like maybe 10 seconds, turn her head away and then come back completely void of any responsiveness in her face. She won't smile, she won't laugh, she won't talk, she won't do anything. That one-year-old baby, in other words, we're not talking about people, you know, being abused or, you know, in other words, we're not talking about something serious. We're talking about a one-year-old absolutely going berserk that his mother won't respond to him. In seconds, it immediately knows something has changed. It immediately starts reaching out, trying to figure out, how do I get her back? I mean, it's, it's almost traumatic watching this, you know, until the woman finally, you know, okay, go ahead, respond to the kid again. You know, the kid just like melts, you know, again, like, oh God, where the frig did you go? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and and the, cues, the cues can be really small. I mean, a lot of this is very subtle about presence and attention and so forth. Susan, go ahead. I was just going to ask if any any of you have um, encountered the work of um, Ken Friston. No. Um, I think I think this group would actually like this. And the one thing that I took away, I mean, he's, he's an extremely prolific writer, um, and he's um, you know a philosopher, but in England and. Um, the thing that I took away was uh, on, the, on the heels of reading about uh, um, octopuses and their, and their intelligence from the Peter Godfrey Smith book was uh, that he, he says to be alive is to know that uh, there is a, that, that, is to have expectations and know that you have expectations. Well, anyway, that's, that's consciousness, but to, to, not, to have expectations. And he goes through, so I've been doing a mental exercise whenever I hear something. So Bill, when I heard you talk about that last example, that, that child at one had expectations and the expectations were not met. Right. And, and you can, it is so interesting to me, it's as profound as system one and system two, that, that so much of the local stuff that we do is about what we expect. And, and if it's not there, we're unhappy. Or, um, we're, did you, or it, we're, and Susan, yeah. Susan, was it Carl Friston or Ken Friston? Yeah, it was Carl. Okay. I knew I had it wrong, yeah. And I still, I'm, this has been a very, very frustrating call for my brain, by the way, guys, because pretty much <laughs> everything you named is not in my goddamn brain, and that will be fixed. <laughs> right. That, I promise you will be fixed by the end of the day. <laughs> but I mean, this is like Stump the Band with Johnny Carson, and y'all are, are gonna get like Buicks at the end of the day, so. Well, I enjoy it again, Susan, the, the thing about, because it, you, you, you reach for happiness, but then you kind of turn back from it, I think. That, yeah. that, that, and I was listening to, uh, I was, it was probably Ezra Klein interviewing Kahneman the other day. And, and they were going through some of the, you know, the contradictions in our, in our behavioral economics and, and how we, you know, essentially we, 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 know, we know that, you know, that, that we kind of remember the last thing most, you know, so, yeah, yeah. so they were asking, well, do you, like when you plan your vacation, do you, do you end with a really fun thing so that you remember your vacation? 
And Adam goes, no. It's like, you know, it's like, and we, none of us do, right? We, we don't, we clearly don't optimize for happiness. That, right. that isn't what drives us. You know, you can look at your own behavior and know it isn't happiness you're maximizing. Um, yeah. But it is, yeah, right. And we often aren't aware of our own expectations, right? Which is, which are resentments waiting to happen. Unstated expectations are resentments waiting to happen. Yeah, that we're not hurting the right people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. the other things about expectations is they guide perception. Mm. You know that experiment yeah. where they have the monkey walking back there, but it's all about what people yeah. are trying to expect. So you yeah. don't even see it if it's right. your right. So yeah, just try this experiment for a while and see how many things you can explain, interactions that happen on the basis of failed or, or not expectation. So, so a, a small pet peeve of mine currently, uh, people like Shane Parrish are making heroes out of Robert Cialdini, who exists in my brain under dangerous knowledge and wrote the book Influence, <clears throat> or rather Persuasion, who has now coined the term persuasion, mm -hmm. which is how do you prime people to be convinced of something before you've even shown up, before they've sort of dealt with the question. And I'm like, Jesus, really? So we're busy, we're busy training generations of smart people in how to spin us and, and manage those expectations before we even realize it's happening. Great. Sounds, yeah. sounds lovely. Go, <laughs> and go, that's, that's what we're doing. Go Shane. Yeah, this is, like, that's not new. It's just giving a name to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it used to be it's called brainwashing, didn't it? But once you, give it a, once you give it a name and once you broaden it, more people can then seize it and do it. It's a little bit like uh, crystallizing you, public opinion by Bernays, right? It's, uh, once you it's, formalize it, you can figure out how to fight it. That to sort of. So how do you fight Trumpism? Um, two by fours? I mean, um... <laughs> torches? No, no, no. A, a march with torches? Not good. No, no, no. no. Two, two by fours. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, I think that um, backfires. Speaking of which, Jerry, I, I watched uh, Babylon Berlin. Wow. Mm. Wow. Isn't it great? <clears throat> and it's, uh, I'd almost like every American to see it because, uh, you, hey, check out the Weimar Republic, everybody. <laughs> you have some lessons for us. There, you know, the, the place where I am in the series, and I'm, this is a little bit of a plot spoiler, it turns out <clears throat> that there was, a, there was an, a, a fighter base, a little airplane training base in Russia Mm -hmm. um, during the Weimar Republic, because of course the German army wasn't allowed to, you know, rearm, and the Russians were trying to be helpful. So German pilots went to Russia to train how to fly. Then they went to Spain for Guernica and for like like the Spanish Civil War to practice. All of which led to World War II. But but what you know, and, and it, it's all busy like happening undercover, and it, it happens here, it happens there. It's super interesting. So that's that's a plot point in in Babylon Berlin, but. Um, Super interesting stuff. Well, as I recall, wasn't it the Germans who um, funded Lenin and sent him back into Russia? Yeah. I love history. I love history too. And, <laughs> and, and uh, so the war reparations under the Versailles Treaty were so onerous uh, that the British, whose foreign policy was always... Don't, don't forget John Maynard Keynes wrote a book pointing out, and he was at the Treaty of Versailles <clears> with the British, he said, next war is coming because of this. Exactly. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so the treaty is so onerous that a, a British foreign policy is always, hey, there can never be one dominant power on the continent. And at the end of World War I, the dominant power is France. Germany is a mess. Germany is economically just completely devastated. So the British fund any German repayments for, for the treaty. So the, the British basically helped the Germans get back on their feet and get moving. The French, meanwhile, are pointing east and going, the, the Bosch, they're gonna come again. Look at them, look at them. They're, 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 they're busy taking back stuff. And of course, that's how it plays out. I also, if, uh, <clears throat> interesting book, Lords of Finance. It's a fascinating book. Uh, we Americans actually threw a lot of money. Our bankers, just like they did in Latin America, you know, these last couple of decades, we went to Germany and loaned them money hand over fist. Oh. And a lot of problem yeah. That's why it works over there now. Or sort of. Please expatiate, Susan. What are you saying? Well, I was just thinking that where, where should we be watching? Well, uh, we, did, we did after the Second World War, but I'm, I'm looking out for the next one. I'm looking out who are we helping, right? So we're helping, we're helping China a lot. Oh, yeah. A lot. 
And in fact, Bill Clinton, I mean, we've engineered it. Uh, and, and, and remember, the hope was, is by bringing the Chinese into the world order, that they would not go to militarism. And in fact, speaking of consumerism, we wanted them to get addicted to consumerism. Yep. And if you think about it, I mean, it really, this has been a peaceful way to get a lot of people out of poverty and right. people in poverty do desperate things. Mm. So uh, I, I, I'm largely behind the plan that we've done with China. Yeah. Uh, it, but we shouldn't be naive about it. No. And we are naive about it, I think. I mean, I, and, we, somewhat, and somewhat uneducated about it. I mean, this, the finance minister of, of Greece, the, the one that was there during the debacle and everything, is basically doing a lot of speeches to, to, to make sure that people are aware of... This is Varoufakis. Uh, right, Giannis Varoufakis. The, the fact that a lot of people, myself included, before I heard from him, thought that the problems in Germany that came out of World War I were due to the hyperinflation that that basically led to Nazism and the Nazis taking over. What he points out is that you, if you actually look at the facts, it wasn't until they went into deflation that the Nazis started coming up. They only had, when they were in the hyperinflationary period, they only had 3% of their parliament that were the Nazis. Within 18 months of the time that it shifted into deflation, they went to 33%. Deflation, he said, is what causes that, that angry mob response because they're losing everything, they're losing their jobs, they're losing their homes, everything is going downhill. Hyperinflation is not the problem. And yeah, that was yeah. almost literally manufactured, you know, in order to get rid of the reparation with requirements. I was just going to say that inflation is a great way to evaporate debt. Right. Mm. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> FYI, we have just gone through about mm, 15 years of deflation worldwide. Mm -hmm. And look uh, at the response. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, Mr. Parker, um, We've gone all over the place on these topics. I'm curious which of these things are interesting to you or if you'd like to take us in a different direction. Oh, I, I think they're all interesting. I, I don't think, I'm not sure if I actually have any particular direction to go in. A couple of things spark off from the discussion on gender uh, because it's so wide and broad. I agree so whole, wholeheartedly with that being a very, very key thing. Um, particularly interesting to me at the moment is the, is how the relationships in gender are mirrored in our relationship with nature and in sustainability and uh, and the way that we actually treat the planet as if it were simply there as a as a utility and, and required no real empathy, respect, or consideration. Yeah. So that's, my, that's, that's one thing which has been running in my mind just recently, just because I've, I'm looking at uh, doing something around sustainability and the environment in terms of actually trying to help people who are working in those fields deal with the constant avalanche of uh, bad news. So we're trying to come up with something which actually means that they don't just they don't just give up out of become totally hopeless basically and can keep coming up with solutions because the the if you're working on the front line in those areas then just every day is just like boom oh well there goes another species yeah um, so and I think it is for any of us who are reasonably reasonably you know, conscious or in the least bit bothered about what's happening, but yeah. So that's, a, that's one of my main themes coming up this year. Maybe doing a workshop in Iceland um, with somebody who's uh, a professor in climate studies, so which will be an invitation thing to, uh, to get people to consider ways in which we can help to mitigate the, the degree of stress to which they're all subject because of the sphere they're working in so that they can carry on actually being able to come up with solutions and ideas and, and see that there might be some way out of this. That sounds great. Have you, um, you know Hrund through Marty, right? I beg your pardon? Um, so through Marty Spiegelman, you probably know Hrund, Gunstein's daughter in, in Iceland? 
No, I don't actually know. This is a connection stream, uh, my involvement with the Schumacher Institute in the UK. Oh, okay. We should, um, if, if your Iceland thing starts to come to fruition, we should connect you with Rund because yeah, she's sure. interested in the topic and she does good work. Um, she did the documentary Insight. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Which yeah. is about intuition, um, right. which is now viewable on Netflix. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen it several times and I've discussed it with Marty a couple of times. It is really interesting. And there's, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there um, around Ian McGilchrist's work around the privileging of the of left hemisphere thinking over right hemisphere thinking and stuff like that as well, which actually plays right, can be seen as playing right back into into the gendered polarization thing also. Ian McGilchrist, the master and his emissary. That's right, yeah. Um, <laughs> which was a much bigger, thicker book than I thought was going to be. <laughs> back in the day when, yeah. I actually, when I bought physical books, it's funny because now I buy mostly Kindle, so you can't tell on Kindle that yeah. this is a tome and this is not a tome, it's just a page count, who the hell knows? And they don't give you a visual. It's, like, it's not like I can get a view of my library where the books are stacked, right? They, they don't give a damn anymore about the visual or the heft or the texture <clears throat> of what used to be called a book, which now we have to call a book book, just you know, to differentiate, or a book classic, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Pardon? Really, I said. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so anyone want to check in and, and uh, take us in a, in a different direction? Well, I, when, we, when I saw the topic of abundance, it's one of the four principles that is really the foundation of a lot of the work we do. Um, um, we've struggled a bit with what's the opposite of abundance. We've always used the word scarcity, although scarcity seems inadequate as an opposite of abundance. Um, hmm. Because it has two, two dimensions, and you know, scarcity is there aren't many of them, or it's very hard to get, because it's difficult. So difficulty to achieve versus availability are two different things. As I'd be interested, maybe has maybe has some ideas on abundance versus whatever the opposite of abundance is. <laughs> I think the opposite will be fear-based. Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's oh. meanness. <laughs> Sorry. I think it's meanness. Meanness, ah. <laughs> a meanness of resources, a meanness of feelings, and a meanness of thinking. Interesting. Hmm. Like Gergrind, Gergrind in um, Car Times, Charles Dickens. <laughs> so we're, we're taking, mean, taking mean back to its, its older meaning. Ah. Yeah. Um. I see a two by two. Ooh, Susan, Susan's got a Ooh. consultant's perspective on this. <laughs> well, I just was thinking that maybe we should put the abundance and scarcity on one dimension and on the other dimension, figure out two other, two other things to at least broaden the conversation um, instead of either or. Right. Um, and uh, um, I was going to, um, what was the last? Oh, meanness. I, I think that... Well, a meanness of, that's kind of like a, uh, a, uh, a murder of prose. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's in that genre. And, and meanness could be one of those. Gen um, generosity, so um, generosity uh, yeah. versus, you know, because I, I just see fear. Fear is the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it isn't the whole thing because we have lots of things <clears throat> we don't just do things because of fear. In fact, quite often, fear is not a motivator. I mean, look at, look at all the things that we could be fearful of that we're not. Oh, well, we, we ignore a whole bunch of things we ought to be fearful of. Good point, Susan. Well taken. <laughs> yeah. Let me, um, let me share the screen for a second because I just discovered something interesting in my brain. Ha. Huh. Um, as follows. Um, I have a bunch of thoughts that real I realized um, that, you know, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's human oops, connection. I got a connection, exactly, um, which comes out of uh, Johan Hari. Hmm. Oops. Hmm. There's a couple of really nice ones uh, here. The opposite of poverty is not wealth, it's justice. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's a nice one. Uh, the opposite of consumption isn't thrift, it's generosity. Generosity was occurring to me. It's, it's yeah. the opposite of meanness. I think, yeah, I, think I like that, that opposition. Yeah. And I didn't realize I had all these, so I'm going to actually connect them up to the thought opposites. <laughs> So, Susan, I have a two by three now. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, go for it. Well, that's unusual. Well, I, mean, I don't just, know if that's permitted. I know. It's, it's maybe very I'm, hard to keep in mind, is the problem. I, I, might, I might be violating a rule here. but So one axis is abundance and scarcity. The other is meanness, fear, and generosity. Uh -huh. well, you've only got to go one more, and we'll be back to the two by four. We'll okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> we well, can just keep growing it. <laughs> But it seems to me fear is the extreme state. Meanness is a result of fear, and generosity yes. is kind of the, the other end of that spectrum. I think meanness being a result of fear is a great thing. In fact, then maybe that's where we could tuck a fear away, actually. Yeah. Meanness. And that's, that's really, I'm sorry, go ahead, Susan. No, I was just going to say that's a, if you think about, um, well, if you go back to the, uh, uh, to the octopus, and expectations, then, then, the, then uh, it just sets it up. It sets up fear, like you said. And the, uh, disappointment, where does disappointment fit with fear? <laughs> so what's interesting here- What a good question, that was Greg. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Repeat the question please, Greg. Well, so, so tying expectations into this, when expectations aren't met, then we're disappointed right. um, or re and even resentful. Um, and how does that relate? How does disappointment relate to fear, I guess? is. I would, it certainly engenders fear, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, disappointment engenders a whole lot of things. Yeah. It depends on how big a thing it is. Yeah. Ooh, I like where that's going. Um, one, We've got a whole theory going here, people. I like that. But one of the things I was thinking just right at, at the tail end of this conversation was that what we have right now in the world is kind of this fear versus love kind of approach, except a lot of people on the left are using fear as well, right? The coming climate apocalypse oh, yeah. is, is a call to fear. It's not a call to connection or love um, or empathy or, or whatever else. I, and and a big piece of what we're talking about in the middle here is the feeling of belonging or connectedness, uh, some bit about empathy, uh, et cetera, and, and how these things all play out together. So, and I'm, I'm wondering, what's, what's the antidote to the glowing populist revolt around the world? Because there's a whole bunch of people voting in governments that are creating illiberal democracies, things that look and smell like democracies, but in fact are not functional democracies. They're more or less autocratic dictatorships of some sort that might go on forever because these people are making themselves presidents for life and things like that. Um, well, so I think history is important back there. That, that whole thing about what happened in Germany, I mean, when the real triggers of that, we should be looking for those. And I've, I've read things about that bring out one or the other of the, of the things that drive that fascism, for instance. Yeah, yeah you, don't, you don't want to read Hannah Arendt's like she her four books about this are just it's uh, so contemporary it's very frightening. Yeah, it's, yeah, uh, good point. Yeah, and I, I really love Hannah Arendt. I think she's greatly under underappreciated as a philosopher. Um, How do you spell that? Sorry, Hannah Arendt. I just I'm typing it in. Okay, thank you. It's good I'm retiring because it's going to take me a year to read all this stuff. Oh, totally, totally. <laughs> Longer than that, I've been reading, catching up for the last four years in my return. Uh, you know what else you could do? You, you could call Bo and set up a call with him separately and pick his brain. Just like, all right, Bo, I'm, 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 I'm sending you a bottle, of, a bottle of brandy. Tell me everything about Hannah Arendt. It's, yes. <laughs> Here's, and, take and, more than one bottle of brandy for sure. And that's probably true. Um, and it is Bo. Uh, Greg, I just put a link to my brain for Hannah Arendt, uh, but I have not read her books like Bo has, so I don't have his, his depth of knowledge on it. Thanks. So what I, I really like The Economist wrote something about this because what we were talking about is how do we stop this. And then what it said is the, the, the tenor of the article was liberalism got too comfortable with itself. 
Yep. And that w- yep. liberalism has always survived by responding. And we need, we, we got, we got to go. Go ahead, Susan. I think we did get too comfortable with ourselves. No, I was just, I was going to say that that looks a little bit like the progressive movement. Um, and so I, I'm really mad that it's being described as more left. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that's the. More I mean, what do you well, mean? The, those two things are getting juxtaposed in the press in a way that I wish they wouldn't. So we started the call with the conversation about how sometimes the background issue is very different from the foreground issue and would cause you to go about solving a problem very differently, something like that. Um, for me, a piece of what's happened here is, I, I'm going to say something I've said a couple times before with Yitan, with Rex, with here probably, which is I, I borrow yin and yang from Taoism. Uh, yin is typically feminine receptive earth energy dark energy and yang is typically masculine outward bright active energy it doesn't mean that all men are yin and all women are uh, all men are yang and all women are yin it means that a healthy entity whether it's an individual a family a society needs to have yin and yang energies in creative tension and i happen to like this some people hate dualistic models i like this one a lot and my my amateur theory of history is that somewhere way back either 300 to 3000 years ago yang won so the forces of paternalism, uh, basically, analy- and then I overload the yang term to say that it's also analytic, scientific, hierarchical, paternalistic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, like you can make your own list, but that, those forces won and pursued a scorched earth strategy against yin, demonizing yin. It wasn't, hey, yin, let's come and make a future. It was all yin should be stamped out, destroyed across the world because yin doesn't work. And my belief to bring this up to the current conversation is that um, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party and most religions are basically yang. And their responses and their answers to situations are yang and mostly hierarchical and large government, you know, the, 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 the conservative critique against liberals is big government and lots of taxes. And those kinds of answers tend to be sort of yang. The young and the restless. Shemay, you totally are like, you're, you're a rock star of chat today. Um, um, the agony and the equity. No, how's that go? Um, anyway, so, so my thesis here is that, is that goes back to the conversation we were having about paternalism uh, sort of running rampant and that we need to somehow let the air out of that bubble because, uh, and, and this is why I think the Me Too movement is really important right now and why a piece of what I'm trying to create in the world is roughly, hey, I'm, I'm a white guy. This is our problem, not women's problem. Yeah, Jerry, isn't that all that you just said? That was the point of this book. That's the thesis of this book. Passion of the Western Mind, Richard Tarnas. That's, that's, his, that's what that book says. <laughs> I did not know that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Is it not in your brain? Yeah. The I Passion the book of the is, but I don't think I've read it. Really? Okay, well, that's his, that's his thesis. Damn it. You just enunciated his thesis in its entirety. Huh. Richard Tarnas, there it is. And I, I've not read it. I know little about it. Well, it's good for us to have us all together, right? It certainly is. <laughs> well, certainly. I bet there's like two people on this call that, for whom certainly is a, <laughs> is a meme. <laughs> Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Oh, oh, you know what? This is an unusual group. It might be everybody on the call. <laughs> April, does, does certainly mean anything to you? <laughs> Not to me. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. <laughs> anyway, back to our regularly scheduled program, which is already in progress. Um, well, can I stick in one? I was curious, the, the, the thought about the opposite of abundance gave me a thought too, because it's not, it's not exactly the thing, but maybe it, it spun thoughts around like regeneration. We have often been trying to explain it in terms of it's the opposite of extraction. And that there's some kind of balance between, you know, growing it and taking it somehow or another. And so the mm. generative process tends to be abundant. The extractive process tends to be zero sum or negative. Hmm. And I apologize. I, uh, April was muted, muted and not able to unmute herself. She is now live and with us. 
Hi. Well, I was, hi everyone. I was just going to say that unfortunately I'll crash the party. That doesn't mean anything to me. But, Darn it. Um, yeah, Jerry, I, I'm not, I will follow up with you later on this. Um, I'm not sure how to unmute me, but I've wanted to chime in a couple of times, but have been unable to. <laughs> Shoot. So. Ping me, ping me on Gchat um, and I'll, I'll unmute you if you're, if you've dialed in on the phone. So we'll figure that out. But in, okay. the, in the future, I apologize. Do you want to go back to anything you wanted to, to say? No, not at this point, other than to say happy new year to everybody. <laughs> Thank happy you. New year. Yeah. And welcome to the call, Ken. Yeah, we, we should have said that up front, Jerry. Happy New Year, everybody. We did. Didn't we say Happy New Year? First call of 2019, something like that? I don't know. Or maybe, I, maybe I glossed past the happy part. You did. Oh, and I, yeah. And I absolutely love the poem. Ab it's just so perfect for today and everything around. So thank you for that. Mary Oliver is always good for depth. Always good for depth. Um, I also want to add something, Jerry, about your, your, your thesis. I don't, don't mean please. to reduce it with three about the passion of the Western mind, but having just recently read the Iliad, the Odyssey, and a large part of the Old Testament, I mean, when you read these documents and then you know history, you know that within like the four or 500 years leading up to when those books were written, which was quite in the 1200 BC, both of them, time. So it's interesting. They were the same time, and they weren't that far apart, if you think about it, Greece and Middle East. What you were seeing was the patriarchy had finally finished off the matriarchy, and pretty recently, actually. And a lot of the, and there's parts of the Old Testament where they're making, you know, a Sodom and Gomorrah was a, it, women had a place there. It was a cleanup yeah. action. Yeah. And so when you're reading these books, as I just did recently, they're incredibly brutal and aggressive. <laughs> and, and wow, I mean. The, the, the Iliad, you're just, what it means to be, oh, they're teaching little boys how to kill. The Iliad is all about getting young Greek boys ready to go out there. And when I was reading it, what was so interesting was how technical it is. When you, if I'd seen that movie with Brad Pitt in it, and you're like, wow, there's so much detail. Well, there's that detail in the Iliad because you're teaching them, here's the weak point in the armor. Here's how to kill somebody. They're really teaching that in the Iliad. And when you read it, you can tell they are. Anyway, I don't need to exaggerate the brutality because you can't exaggerate the brutality. Oh my God, it's pornographic. Anyways, so when you read those books, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Bible, you are completely seeing the patriarchy setting it down, and we're living in the aftermath of it to this day. At least in the West. Yes, in the West. I just watched the documentary about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Oh, cool. Her, her arguments with the Supreme Court. And I, I was amazed, I guess maybe I'm naive, about how institutionalized the, the male dominant has been in our legal system and, and how she single-handedly has really helped um, turn that around, at least to start in turning that around. But I, did you watch, the, did you watch um, the documentary RBG or did you watch the new movie that's on Netflix? No, the documentary. Okay. Not the movie. Is the movie good? Have you seen the movie? Uh, I've not seen the movie. I'm dying to. And the movie is basically about an early case that she had that was in an appeal court, I think, something like that. Never made it to the Supreme Court. Oh. But, but she did something that was really, really awesome, which is in order to op open up women's equality, she chose a case about men. Right. Yeah. That, that's in the documentary. That It's completely brilliant. It's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna show how this case for this man, it was a tax case, where yeah. he was trying to get a write-off for his nanny, but the law basically said, no, this, is only, only, this, this is only applies to women, can only benefit from it. And, and she pried open the door with that, which is like, that, that's how these things happen sometimes. It's like yeah. something is used that, that wasn't intended that way that, that opens the door. I'm, the just, just, I'm still pissed at her. Oh. RB, at RBG? Mm -hmm. For which thing? Because, um, because uh, towards the end of his term, uh, but like shortly after the beginning of the, of the second, second, uh, second term, Obama asked her to consider retiring because she was getting up there in years and her health wasn't that great. Mm -hmm. And because he didn't want to run the risk of her being replaced by a Republican successor. And she, she out and out refused. Mm -hmm. And uh, so... <clears throat> And there's but, now, but now she survived into at least the. Uh, she just missed a she just missed a session, so yeah, we don't we don't know what's up. 
Yeah. yeah. I don't understand. What, I never understand that that argument though. Why would it have been any different than what happened to to Garland to Merrick Garland? Um, the 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 point at which he asked her was still fairly early in his second term, so not to say McConnell wouldn't have tried tried to do something to screw it up, but um, that particular the argument that McConnell used around for for Merrick Garland wouldn't have applied. It, it didn't um, apply when he made it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, no, that's that's a, a very good point, but. Um, I mean, now there's a very good chance. I think there's an excellent chance that Trump's mm -hmm. going to pick a replacement. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just my side. Hey, I got a question for the group. So we talked earlier about liberalism. We've got we got too comfortable. Well, what what are the ideas? What do we have here in the group about where do, what's our innovation now, or where how are we going to evolve liberalism forward? Can I just point out, I, I posted something that Otto Scharmer has, has recently written. It, it's called, it's an article in Medium called Turning the Tide, Living Inside the Axial Shifts. And basically what he's indicating, which, you know, anybody can determine whether or not they believe it, is that we're beginning to turn away from left, right, and what he is calling open and closed as an alternative axis for discussion on politics and in economics rather than government versus markets, it's well-being for the all versus GDP are the axis points. And then on education, it's rather than public-private, it's whole child versus memorizing knowledge, you know, are the axis points. And he's basically suggesting that there's more and more evidence of that axial shift, as he calls it, that's going on. I, I hope so, because in political economy in my school, I remember I had a, a great Cambridge professor who taught us how to manipulate elections, or lip, uh, manipulate Congress with closure rules, with, with game theory. The uh, two dimensions, it was always a, an artificial construct. It, nothing fits in this politically, <laughs> never did. I think one of the things I'm thinking is that, uh, uh, where did I go? I lost myself, lost Zoom. Can you uh -oh. hear me? Yeah, we're right here, we okay. hear you. So, I was just gonna say that um, I, I'm increasingly, increasingly thinking that the media is a problem. Um, and media? I hate to say that. <laughs> Which media? Uh, media, yeah. Old, and, and, old it, and new probably, right? Yeah, and and, Broadcast, social, everything. I'm just trying to get a sense of. Well, the, how you're the uh, I think what I'm thinking is that they they buy into this either or argument all the time. It's always either or, either or, either or. It doesn't matter what they're talking about. It's either or. And we just can't have that kind of dualism. We've lost any sort of perspective. Perspective. We've lost any sort of nuance. We've lost any sort of. But partly, partly I think what's happened, Susan, is that one of the parties of the far right has figured out that dualism leads to winning elections and yeah. provokes fear. And they're, they're yeah. basically using this in very, very intentionally undermining facts, undermining science, undermining everything, getting people pissed off because it energizes the base and it wins elections. I think the key is like, how do we, how do we undermine that process from, from like taking over? Yeah, Jerry, I was really struck. I mean, you've been making this point for a while and pointing about Newt Gingrich. And when uh, Bush Sr. died, and then it comes out that when Bush Sr. went back on the taxes thing, that's when Newt Gingrich. So it was really fascinating how what you've been talking about for some time now was brought up again rather recently about, and that was a seminal moment. Newt Gingrich stopping off. Boy, that guy got something done. Newt Gingrich changed, changed discourse in America much for the worse. Yeah. A pretty single-handedly. He, yeah. he was this little guy from a nowhere district in the House, not the Senate of Georgia. I mean, and, and suddenly he was the Speaker of the House, which you know, mercifully didn't last very long because that blew up too, but uh, a messy, messy thing. Well, let's go back to Susan's point. I mean, remember, yeah. I remember reading the book in college, Boys on the Bus, so horse racing. I mean, the, the press has had a lot of problems for a long time. So let's evolve that, Susan. Let's, let's keep going. So dualism, you know, the, the horse race mentality. I tell you one thing, my wife being, you know, a, a senior executive, a president of a company, when it, people come to interview from the press, 
press is so desiccated. It's obvious. They're just like, uh, what behind the ears? The yeah. press doesn't seem to even have money to hire good people to work for it anymore. Just that and Yes, that and they also, you know, I don't know how many times if you go to a place that has a bunch of newspapers, whenever there's something that happens in the world, it's the same photo. <laughs> it's the same photo in The Economist. It's the same photo. It's a good photo, right? But it's, there's only one, you know, mm -hmm. that's documenting a particular activity. Um, but that's... Uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's hold on to this thought for a while. Uh, yeah. Let's and, think about it. So I read The Financial Times and The Economist. The Financial Times is amazing. I mean, yeah. you've got Lawrence Sumner's and Martin Wolf. And, but my, my subscription costs $300 a year. I know. And I can't, in the, now in retirement, I can't. <laughs> it's like, oh dear. Yeah. And I, when I send it, get an article, I send the text to Jerry because I know he can't get at it. Yeah. So, so, yeah. I, <laughs> so I'm behind this paywall. I get good journalism, but when I go on Facebook, I can't even share it. And the stuff I'm looking at on Facebook, my friend, people sharing, it's just dreck. It's yes. junk. So how do we make how do we make what we do fun? I mean, I mean, when you think about it, uh, negativism is a lot more. I mean, oh yeah, really, totally. So much more, you know, um, energizing. Yeah, this this horse race thing about is is Trump going to get impeached and everything? I really get tired and I get sad about it because. We're not, we're not challenging liberalism and we're not moving ourselves forward. We're, we're there's this horse race mentality and what if it doesn't happen? We've, lo we've all lost. We yeah, lost exactly. a whole bunch of energy and time. I you agree. Know, about that. But we do have to articulate where we're headed now. Yes. To hell? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Hell sounds like more, the people in hell are going to be more fun than the people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Where would oh, you rather be? We should go into hand basket manufacturing. Yeah. yeah. I, when I was around Mormons and they would be telling me that how unrighteous I was, I would, I would point out to them if they were in heaven, I would much prefer to be in hell because that's where the party is. Yes. That's what Mark Twain said, go to hell, heaven for the climate, hell for the company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So Susan, you're asking like, what do we do? And I'm realizing I have a thought in my brain called the Rex platform. Um, and it has a bunch of different things that like if somebody made me king tomorrow, like what I would try to implement. And I realized looking at the list that they're not that happy. They're not, this doesn't come from the space of the joy of connectedness and, and honoring people and everything else. And I think it, it needs a lot more of that. Um, but, um, but there's a whole bunch of things in here like revoke corporate personhood, uh, rethink democratic participation so people are actually sort of back in. Um, uh, there's a bunch of very specific things in here. Form as code. Da, da, da. Create should, a US you should make a survey out of that. Yeah. Send it to the House of Representatives and see what people think. Yeah. I mean, it would be nice to know what people think about those issues or, you know. Yeah. And I don't think a survey gets at what people think. Uh, well, it may get at what they think or they think they think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> certainly doesn't. A survey, can be, a, a survey can be a good conversation starter. Yeah. So one thing that um, we've been talking about quite a bit is fear. And um, you know, I put, jotted down in the, in the chat a while back that fear is a fast catalyst, empathy is a slow catalyst. So we think about using fear as an engine of change for good or for ill. It's because we respond quickly to it, mm -hmm. um, you know, as opposed to, to love, which is a, a slow burn. And just in doing some, uh, a little bit of uh, side research uh, about um, how much of the brain is used for face recognition, because it's a conversation we were having earlier in the, you know, in today. Um, just discovering that f fear faces are the first to be recognized by an infant. A, a five month old infant will, will respond to a fear face more, uh, first before any other kind of change of expression. Now that evolved, that expands quickly, but fear is, is the first response. And so you know, there's something- You have to give babies Raggedy Ann early. Why Raggedy Ann? Because the features on Raggedy Ann are very, uh, they're very human and there's a smile. And so it's, it's easy, the, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, 
are, uh, are very present. It's an interesting thing about dolls. There's a, a lot of work on dolls. Hmm. No. All right. Uh, I disagree. <laughs> well, just the, uh, but just thinking about how much of our, you know, we talk about meanness as a result of fear. We talk about fear being used by the other side or being used by uh, the, the left uh, to in order around climate. And I just, um, I just wonder if there, is there a, what is the fast catalyst response? I mean, what is, what is a positive emotion that has the same kind of fast response that we get from fear? Um, sex. sex, I think that's all you get. Ple pleasure sex, is baby. what came to mind. I was going to say, yeah, well, last. Male brains or female brains? <laughs> what, what did you say? Human brains. I, I said pleasure. Okay. Yeah, but the same, you know, same general topic. Um, so how can we, how do you sex up climate change? Um, <laughs> nice. Well, there is the naked news. Um, As, except that's Russian propaganda. Oh, good point. Good point. Um, partly, like, like, uh, just to go with what you're saying, Jimmy, the you know the uh, the shot of uh, the shot of cortisol or adrenaline that runs through you when the fear response hits is one of the fastest human responses there is. That's that's like it, it's it's a little bit like anti lock braking systems, where you're like, no, 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 no. A car is going to hit an object, and before your head tips forward, sensors are going to trigger a balloon that explodes in front of your face and protect. What? How? And yet it works, right? It's like, damn, that's pretty. That's pretty slick. The human fear response is, is like that, like shaboom, right? Um, and so I think part of the question is, what are these other connective responses that can overpower that? Uh, or set aside the need for that or whatever. And, and, and I, I, think, I think somehow, you know, love conquers fear is, is a piece of the strategy here. With enough time. With enough time. But do we have enough time? Well, it's yeah. interesting. Are we allowed it. enough time? I mean, if you were trying to model what, what you're saying, I mean, it, uh, so it's like, I'm, you know, part of what I was saying earlier is like, it's not happiness that we're maximizing or optimizing around. Right? It's probably closer to fear. Mm -hmm. um, but we're probably, but even I would love to like know the model because I don't think we're not like maximizing fear either. We're optimizing it. So we want the, we want, we want enough fear that life is exciting in some sense. I swear there's some kind of a feedback loop, you know, and it, and there may, I, I wonder if like in society, part of the, we've gotten too lazy is life got a little too good. We needed to juice it some, create some catastrophes because that makes life more exciting, you know, and so, I, I don't know. I, I did a uh, science fiction game book uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, Steve Jackson games, uh, role-playing game system, transhuman space. So I wrote something about a, a good couple hundred pages on um, what, what the culture of 2100 is like um, in a moderately realistic sci-fi world. And one of the things I talked about were cultural extremophiles that basically people who had, through both activity and engineering, you know, basically evolved themselves into seeking out the maximum biochemical action in their brains. And so they're kind of cultural extremophiles. And uh, I don't know if that fits entirely, but just what you were saying there, David, just you know, plug that into me. And I love David's. I love David's point because horror movies. Why do people watch horror movies? Indeed. Don't know. Um, we are getting near the end of our time. Um, anybody Somebody with a save us. Somebody save us quick. Toxic transhuman space toxic memes. Nice. Yep. Transhuman space toxic memes. That's the book? That's the book. Dang. Yeah, I, I'll throw in a poem from Dina Metzger. I was going to try and put it in the chat, but I realized when I hit shift return, it's, it just put the first line in. The, the poem, is called, poem is called Song. 
He says, there are, we are, there are those who are setting fire to the world. We are in danger. There is time only to work slowly. There is no time not to love. And I've been coming back to that poem for many years now because I constantly get this sense of tremendous urgency of, my God, the planet's burning up around us. We've got to do something, and I've got to wake people up. And, and I can only work with what I have where I am in touch with the people that I'm in touch with. And I can only, I can only be effective when I demonstrate love and care for them. And the making of other, which I admit I engage in pretty often, and I really try to dial that back, but to grant legitimacy to the people that I, that I am in great disagreement with is a really hard practice. Mm. And, um, and if, if we're going to uh, engage people who are in the grips of fear and whose amygdala is being constantly um, you know, tweaked by the media or whatever, we've got to demonstrate to them that we understand where they're coming from and we grant them some kind of legitimacy. And that is a really, really hard practice that after 30 years of meditation and you know, 14 years of Qigong practice and 10 years of yoga, it's like I still, my body gets into this state of, uh, what am I going to do? So I seek out fellow people that I can talk to and say, you know, be in these conversations and, and, and just keep on putting one foot in front of the other with the, the hope that somehow it's going to work out, but not, uh, no, I'll reframe that. I have the faith that it will somehow work out because faith is confidence and possibility, but I don't have the hope that it will work out because hope to me is something that's ungrounded and, and aspirational that I can't always connect with. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, that we end this call. That was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, shoot, I wanted to add something else. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to say that I mentioned this, the Aboriginal uh, talks that I've been watching and one of them that I posted to Facebook, which I found really moving, uh, was a woman who was talking about deep listening as a path to healing the intergenerational trauma. And she tells a story in her talk, three different stories, I think, of moments where she could actually hear other people and hear their stories and what she did to draw out those stories, because these were people who were in shock. And it's really beautiful. It, they like, really, I was stunned by, uh, uh, by her ability to communicate. Let me see if I can quickly find um, the talk. Yeah, here it is. Uh, the value of deep listening, the Aboriginal gift to the nation. Um, I will post the link. It, it is by Judy Atkinson, whom I have not heard of before. And uh, here is the talk. Um, and I think there's a big piece of that to be done for all of us. I think there's a big piece of listening carefully. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so there we are. I agree, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Now, there's a there's a good point to end on. <laughs> it makes me realize that I've given up. <laughs> Which is not a good thing. Maybe humanity just isn't worth it. We're not as special as we think we are. Well, we can't give up. We can't give up. This is too juicy. I, too juicy an issue, isn't it? I love that poem, Ken. Thank you, Greg. And I think what you just named is really important. I don't know if people are familiar with Renee Wurtzman, but she's doing a lot. She's a psychologist doing a lot of work on. Um, climate change. And she said, you know, it's really important to bring in this third piece in the conversation. We often talk about our anxieties and our aspirations, but we need to talk about our ambivalences. You know, mm -hmm. I just named an ambivalence of, mm -hmm. yeah, I know it's important and I don't want to do it. She right. says, I know I should give up meat to help climate change, but I'm a meat eater. I don't, I'm ambivalent about giving that up. And there's something very normalizing that, that humanizes when we say, yeah, I know it's important, but I don't want to do it. Let someone else do that. Because then we can start to deepen the conversation and include more people about what are you ambivalent about? And you'll find, I think, more common ground when we do that. Mm -hmm. And maybe even the movement towards doing something. Some progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. No. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, that was a great conversation. I, I, my, my brain has opened up in lots of interesting ways. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your being here. And uh, see you again in a month, but uh, we'll make some calls out of this. And 
if you want to propose topics for, for you know, if there were pieces of this that I'm happy to turn any of pieces of this into an inside Jerry's brain call or other kinds of things, put a note on the Rex list, put a note on the inside Jerry's brain list, send me an email, whatever it is. Um, and we'll pick out some pieces of this and go, go deeper. Um, cause I think this, we're onto some really good stuff here. But, do you have an IJB happening in a half hour? I do on abundance. In fact, ah. how about that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually thought that's what this call was and it started at 10. So I, I apologize, but oh. it seems I managed to fit myself in. Well, there we are. Yeah. Cool. Same room. So um, see, uh, see a couple of you in uh, less than 30 minutes. Yep. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.